colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's my pleasure to co-chair this session, Bronchology 2. I think some of the chairmen will come later because we are behind the schedule. I would like to uh, ask the first speaker in this session, Professor Casperini. Already, Professor Casperini had uh, a talk this morning, lovely talk about the past, present, and future. Again, he's the head of respiratory disease unit, Department of Internal Medicine, Immunology, and Respiratory Disease. Zainda Ospandelio Universitari. The presentation of Professor Casparini will be about the bronchoscopic biopsy techniques in the era of lung cancer targeted therapy. Please, Professor Casparini. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, yes, you know that uh, in the last year, a lot of things uh, changed in the lung cancer treatment, management, diagnosis, because uh, the epidemiology change. Uh, when I start to work as pulmonologist, I remember that uh, squamous cell lung cancer was the most frequent uh, lung cancer. Now, completely, <coughs> epidemiology has changed because we have an epidemic of uh, uh, adenocarcinoma that has become the, the most frequent form. Second point, uh, when I started to work, the diagnosis of non-small cell lung cancer was enough to start with treatment. Now we have to differentiate squamous versus no squamous because histotype matters in terms of uh, different treatment. And also, in the last year, we developed and discovered the oncogenic drivers. That means molecular changes of DNA that make uh, stimulate the growth of the tumor and may have influence on the tumor treatment. So all these changed, changed uh, our management of lung cancer. Uh, and in the future, it will be more challenging because, uh, as you know, new molecular markers are discovered and uh, probably in the next year, we will have a lot of molecular markers that uh, should be identified in lung cancer to uh, go with the correct treatment. What does it mean? Does it mean that we need tissue? for the diagnosis of lung cancer. Tissue is the issue, is very famous uh, uh, sentences that was uh, proposed in 2010 by uh, Hirsch in this paper because uh, the different characteristic molecular, biological, and histotype characteristic of lung cancer change completely our uh, behavior in the treatment. So for a personalized medicine of lung cancer, tissue is the issue. But what is the problem? The problem is that whole, in the whole world, 80% of lung cancer are diagnosed just by small biopsy obtained by bronchoscopy or by fine needle aspiration technique. So tissue is the issue, but we have techniques to diagnose lung cancer, the tallow us to get not much tissue. What we can do? We can do more with less. We can do a lot of things with our small biopsy it, or with our needle aspiration material. And this is the challenge that uh, uh, the modern bronchoscopists have. This is a question that I do to my student. What is the most frequent complication of bronchoscopy? The most frequent complication of bronchoscopy until a few years ago was do not get diagnosis, useless bronchoscopy. Today, things are changed. 
What is the most complication of bronchoscopy today? Always do not get diagnosis and or do not get adequate material suitable for histotype definition or for molecular evaluation. In other words, this brings a revolution in bronchoscopy. Because in the past year, you know, just few cells were enough to make a diagnosis to say this patient has no small cell lung cancer, is okay. I have three cells, no small cell lung cancer, okay. Enough to start the treatment. Today, a sample with few cells is inadequate for histological definition and for molecular studies and must be considered not diagnostic. So we have a new category of sample. In the past, we have diagnostic sample and non-diagnostic sample. Now we have diagnostic, non-diagnostic, and inadequate positive. What is inadequate positive? Inadequate positive is a sample that allows you to say, yes, this is a cancer, but I have not enough material to make immunohistochemistry, to make biological studies, and to evaluate uh, the uh, mutation of the lung cancer. So inadequate positive, and believe me, is a problem that every day in the clinical practice we see about 15% of bronchoscopy that I do are repetition. The patient already underwent a bronchoscopy. You already know that has a lung cancer, but the material that was sampled was inadequate, and he had to repeat bronchoscopy. He lost time. We lost money. So the most important thing is keep calm and give your best shot during bronchoscopy. Today, the immunohistochemistry helps us a lot to differentiate uh, squamous cell carcinoma by uh, adenocarcinoma, even in cytological material, thanks to uh, immunocytochemistry with a marker like TTF1 that is positive in adenocarcinoma or P40 that is positive in, no, in uh, squamous cell carcinoma. And generally, this is a very nice flowchart because if you have adenocarcinoma, you can send the material for molecular studies, inc included PDL1 for Im that is uh, necessary for immunotherapy. If you have squamous cell carcinoma, again, you require PDL1, or it can require also molecular study in squamous cell carcinoma if the patient is no smoker or if the patient is very young. The percentage of non otherwise specified cancer should be very low less than 10%. This is what the guidelines and the literature recommend. Well, what we can get adequate tissue, what we can do, the first thing is identify, identify the most appropriate tar target. Look at this case, I have to move because there, there is no animation in this way. This patient is a nodule very peripheral nodule here. That is not very easy to sample, but there is also a PET-positive lymph node in the 4L station. So what do you think? It's easier to get material from this nodule, or it's easier to get hibus and to look this 4L lymph node and to get material and at the same time to obtain staging of the disease. So when you have a case of lung cancer, things where is easier to approach the biopsy technique and to get material to better qualify this lung cancer. In this case, it was easy to approach this lymph node and the material that you can see here is full of cells and of tissue and adequate for any purposes.
The second step is select the most appropriate sampling technique and the most appropriate sampling instrument. What is the choice of the sampling technique and of the sampling instrument? Who should guide you in uh, deciding what is the most appropriate sampling instrument? The CT scan is necessary and can give you one that in my opinion is the most important concept to define the strategy, the biopsy strategy. And uh, the question is, is the lesion central? Can I identify the lesion with my bronchoscope? Can I see the lesion with my bronchoscope? Or is the lesion peripheral? Probably I will see anything with my bronchoscope because the lesion is located in the periphery of the lung. Or, third point, is the lesion inside the bronchial system or outside? Today we see a lot of lung cancer patients that have lesion just in the mediastinum and they don't have lesion in the lung or in the bronchi. So one, two, three, completely different strategy. Look at the central lesion. I can use different uh, sampling instrument from, uh, for uh, central lesion. Biopsy, brushing, bronchial washing, transbronchial needle, cryobiopsy. And you can see the sensitivity of this different uh, technique. But all these value are taken by whole the literature. And uh, at that time, 20 years ago, I can say, oh, this sample is uh, positive, so increase my sensitivity, even if three cells were present. So we don't know if this value of sensitivity, based on paper performed before the concept of adequate sample, were really adequate. I think that we have to recalculate everything. And uh, for this reason, I did a research on uh, PubMed, and I looked at uh, for the cytological method of sampling, brushing, washing, there are few papers in the literature that demonstrate that these samples are able to identify the EGFR mutation in lung cancer. But if you search on PubMed and you click bronchial washing and AL key translocation, bronchial brushing and AL key translocation, bronchial washing and PDL1 bronchial brushing and PDL1, you will see that the search results is zero. There is no paper that demonstrate that these means of samples that are very used by bronchoscopy, at least in Italy. I saw a lot of bronchoscopy where bronchial washing for cytological evaluation, bronchial brushing for cytological evaluation. There is no evidence that these means of sampling are able to identify this kind of markers. Bronchial biopsy and ALK mutation, there is some evidence, 12 papers, and uh, bronchial biopsy and PDL1 also, 11 paper. What about the needle? We can also use bronchial needle to sample central lesion. And uh, this can be useful when we have, uh, for instance, uh, a submucosal or intraparietal extension of the tumor, or when we have a large necrotic component. And if we perform biopsy on the surface of the, this tumor, we can have a necrotic tissue that is uh, uh, not suitable for all the histological uh, uh, evaluation. But if you go deep with the needle uh, in, the, uh, par par in the wall, uh, uh, the, uh, 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 in the bronchial wall, you can get more uh, vital cells that can be evaluated. 
So uh, I suggest to use transbronchial needle aspiration, the diagonal is so a central way towards uh, when the pattern is suggestive for some mucosal involvement where there is a large component, uh, necrotic component at least. What about cryobiopsy? Cryobiopsy generally used for diffuse lung disease, but there is also uh, some evidence, and this is German study, that demonstrate that uh, uh, cryobiopsies uh, also may also increase the sensitivity for central endobronchial lesion, uh, and there is a, a better result in, to, in comparison to conventional force biopsy without uh, incidence, uh, uh, major incidence of bleeding. The only problem is uh, that uh, cryobiopsy require intubation of the patient, and uh, this study was performed in Germany where there is the habit to intubate patients uh, uh, in several centers, even for biopsy. Uh, Lutz is here, you can confirm this, uh, that this is true, yes. Uh, that uh, uh, it, not for chance this study was performed in Germany, but I think that cryo cannot be suggested as common system in all the patients. Well, the take home message is, please don't use brushing and washing for central and the bronchial lesion because there is lower sensitivity and poor evidence of adequacy for molecular studies. Take at least four biopsy. Consider the needle when this is the suspect of intramural peribronchial lesion or when there is evidence of necrotic tissue, keep cryobiopsy for difficult cases after negative first biopsy. And what about peripheral lesion outside the range of the bronchoscope? We know that in most of centers around the world, fluoroscopy is the most frequent means of sampling utilized. Now we have a new technique like uh, radial mini probe, uh, uh, EBUS mini probe, like uh, 3D navigation system, like uh, uh, Combi in CT. But uh, it's very strange. There is no one comparative randomized large study that demonstrates that these new techniques are better than fluoroscopy. What we can see based on retrospective study is that maybe this new technique, electromagnetic navigation or rebus, may have a better sensitivity for small lesion, less than two centimeters, that in effect are difficult to visualize with fluoroscopy. But for larger lesion, there is no one study that really demonstrates that this new technology are uh, better than the whole fluoroscopy. In any case, what is the take home message? Please don't perform bronchoalveolar lavage if you have a peripheral lesion, because the sensitivity of bronchoalveolar lavage for peripheral tumor is less than 5%. Despite this evidence, in Italy, I don't know in Egypt or in other countries, but in Italy, when you perform bronchoscopy and you don't see anything and you have peripheral nodule, you perform BAL. I saw a lot of patients that performed bronchoalveolar lavage for peripheral nodule. It's malpractice. It's completely useless. If you don't have a guidance system, please don't perform bronchoscopy in cases like this. The third and last point is hilar mediastinal lesion. Here, Again, there is no choice. You should have the needle to go on the other side of the bronchial wall and to sample the lymph node or the lesion located in the mediastinal area. You can use conventional TBNA if the needle is, if the lesion is larger enough, or you can use, as today happens more frequently and frequently, the EBUS guided transbronchial needle aspiration. But in any case, you should use the needle, no alternatives. Well, is the needle or the material that we can get with the needle uh, uh, enough for the uh, biomolecular study? Yes. The literature is, uh, there is a lot of literature that says that uh, with uh, uh, 
IBUS TBNA, we can get material for EGFR mutation, for ALK translocation, for PDL1 expression. Uh, so the take home message is in case of extra bronchial lesions, please don't perform bronchoscopy without the availability of transbronchial needle aspiration, with or without IBUS. The last point is how to get, uh, to, uh, to get adequate tissue is handling the material in the best way. What we do is uh, uh, this uh, uh, pathway that uh, is taken by a uh, whole paper in the, in the Blue Journal, we do uh, in our routine this procedure. We needle the samples, we discharge the material on a glass slide, we smear the material, we duplicate the, sli the slides to have three, four, five slides, and we fix it in alcohol, the slide, and one slide is used for rapid on-site evaluation. I will have a talk tomorrow on rapid on-site evaluation, and I will try to explain you how to do it even if you don't have the cytopathologist on site. If rose is positive, okay, we are on the target. So we repeat the sample, and the material that we obtain it with the other sampling is put in formalin for cell block. If the rose is negative or inadequate, we start again for step one. We try to repeat the sample. We change the position of the needle. We change the target. Remember, no one patient must be go out from your service without diagnosis. Otherwise, you and the patient have lost money and time. The smear of the cytology has several advantages. You can do rapid on-site evaluation. You can do immunocytochemistry, PD40 and, uh, P, uh, and uh, TTF1. You can define the histotype. You can do molecular evaluation uh, for uh, EGFR and ALK translocation. The cell block has other advantages because uh, it allows you to better define uh, the PDL1. And there are also pathologies that are more used to work uh, on cell block, on histology, in uh, comparison to uh, smeared cytology. Somebody say, ah, but with the needle, you can get few material. Look at this movie and look how much material you can get with the Nibus needle, much more than with the biopsy. Your, but this is just one pass with the needle. And look in the formalin, how many material is available for your pathologist. He can do everything on this uh, uh, amount of material. A lot of slides, a lot of tissue. Okay. So the close cooperation with your cytopathologist is a very important, is a very important step to get adequate tissue. So, this is my conclusion. Bronchoscopic biopsy techniques are able to provide cytostological diagnosis in most cases of tumor located in the airway, in the lung parenchyma, and in the mediastinum. The material obtained by bronchoscopy, both small biopsies or cytological sample, is suitable for histotype definition and molecular evaluation in most of cases. Of course, what is necessary is the use of a correct technique of sampling and adequate technique for processing the material. Please don't send your patient to surgeon for diagnosis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Gasparini, for your excellent expose. We have a time for two short questions and two short answers. Anybody? Let me take the chance as a chairperson. Many times we are facing patients 
with COPD, hyperinflation, emphysema, definite emphysema, and CT even with emphysema tasbulli, and the mass or lesion, it's not peripheral, not subpleural, but it is midway. When we go with bronchoscopy, we found nothing. And when we send this patient to the radiologist, he's afraid that if he's going with CT-guided needle, definitely there is a higher chance of pneumosurics. What's your recommendation in this situation? We perform it by ourselves percutaneous needle aspiration if needed. But uh, in cases like uh, the case that you described, the patient with emphysema and we have COPD, of course, the risk uh, of pneumothorax using percutaneous needle aspiration is very high. So we try, in any case, to get diagnosis transbronchially because in this way the risk of pneumothorax is lower and especially for patients with severe COPD, pneumothorax could be a problem. So we approach percutaneously the peripheral lesion just if an attempt transbronchially is uh, negative and uh, there is no alternative because the risk of pneumothorax is uh, in any case very high. Yes, uh, th that is a good question. Thank you, uh, Ahmed. Uh, we, de we, we do the first pass for rose, for smear cytology. If this is okay and we have enough uh, uh, glasses, uh, three or four glasses, that is uh, what is uh, uh, what our cytopathologists require. Uh, we proceed with other passes uh, to get material into the formal for cell block and generally we do two, three passes more. It depends uh, on the amount of material that we are able to uh, include in formalin, but generally two or three passes are enough. And do you um, uh, yeah. push the needle? Not, not, very, not very fast. Okay. Uh, I move uh, up and down uh, 15, 20 times. It depends. Uh, there is also discussion about the way how to aspirate the material. Uh, there is no uh, evidence in the literature that, for instance, the suction with the syringe is better than the capillarity that somebody uses, removing the stillet and without apply suction. In some cases, uh, this is my habit, but I have no uh, support of literature to, to, to do. It, I start with the syringe, with the vacuum syringe that is provided with the kit of the needle. If I get a lot of blood material, so the second pass is I perform with capillarity. On the contrary, if I get few material, because the lymph node is fibrotic or it doesn't provide enough material, I apply manual aspiration with the syringe. So I increase the negativity. This is my habit, but I have no uh, scientific evidence to support that this is true. Yeah, because I know some friends in the US, they now just put the needle, remove the stylet. Yes, I know, I know. We do it when we have a, a bloody lesion. Thank you very much. Any further questions? Okay, thank you, Professor uh, Gasparini. And it's now uh, we'll move to the next uh, speaker, Professor uh, Lutz Freitag. He will going to speak us about the next generation of airway stints, a possible revolution through uh, 3D printing technology. Professor uh, Freitag is a well-known uh, figure to us. He is a co-founder and the chief of the scientific and officer, consultant of several biotechnical companies. Uh, and he's working in the Department of Pulmonary Medicine, Peace Glen Clinic. Uh, Sent Anna uh, Lawrence since 2006. He's a, he's a professor in Essen University in Germany, visiting professor in uh, Harvard, Stanford, and uh, uh, he is well known that he one of the invented Freitag stint, the Y stint. And he also previously, as I know, that he works in Herne in Germany. Uh, and he was the a friend of Professor Nekostin as well. 
when I, I saw you there in 2000, year 2000. So it's a pleasure to have you here in Egypt, uh, and we are uh, delighted to see your talk. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. After these uh, little technical hurdles, I, I try my best to show you what technology can do. Um, it is, many of the stuff that I'm showing is still in experimental stage. Uh, I apologize for this. This is not uh, part of a big clinical study. It's again from uh, my lab work mainly. We do have many stands now. These are the stands that are commercially available. The most uh, popular one, okay, is, well, this is dying, is the Dumont stand, uh, and some metal stands, and also some bifurcation stands. So we do have a number of stands uh, these days. Do we need more? What? Uh, I want to do is go back a little bit and tell you how it all started. Uh, it started with stents that had originally been made for the uh, vascular system. Uh, this is a Gianturco stent that uh, I have placed into the left stem bronchus, a self-expanding metal stent. And it looked good in the beginning, but a few weeks later we saw this disaster. What you see here is the stent has perforated the wall, and if you take a look at the right picture, you see that the stent had ended up in the esophagus uh, and in the aorta. So from a bronchus to the aorta, uh, it's not so far. So what I had to do in the, uh, that day was I had to take it through the esophagus, the bronchial stent out of the aorta. It was telling the patient survived, but the lesson was that these typical stents that were available were not ideal for a tracheobronchial system. Jean-Francois Dumont was smarter than me. He uh, didn't try metal stents in first place. He uh, invented uh, the first uh, silicone stent and uh, made it very, very popular. And the Dumont stent uh, is now what I would consider the gold standard. It's extremely versatile. Thousands and thousands have been used worldwide. And it's pretty forgiving if you see such a tumor here and you see the uh, stent on the left side. It keeps the airway open, uh, although it's not perfectly shaped. It's a little bit different if we take a look at benign stenosis. Benign stenosis are different. They are not round shaped, usually, we have a kind of a slit here, and it is not so easy to find something that really fits. Because, uh, as you can see here, if we put into such a triangular or slit structure a round-shaped stent, we have very high wall pressures at some points and uh, absolute free space at others. And the result of these pinpoint pressures are uh, illustrated here. These are three completely different materials, different designs, but they all have in common that wherever there is a sharp pressure, uh, we have granulation tissue formation. 
which can result in typical disasters. This is a tracheal stenosis where one stent had been placed that didn't work, the next stent, the next stent, and uh, eventually uh, th there was nothing you could do for these patients. So I uh, wrote it down in the last line, stents in benign diseases are the very, 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 very last option because the side effects are uh, just too big. And we encounter these problems every day. Uh, when you take a look at such a stenosis uh, and take a look at what is available, you can tell from the first place that nothing will really fit. Uh, whether it's the mucosa here or whether it's a big jump in the lumen of the middle uh, image or whether it's very close to the carina and then again stenosis in the main, uh, uh, in the lobar bronchi. So uh, could customized stents solve the problem? Anatomically shaped laser cut stents are available. This is a picture that I've uh, done 20 years ago when I got this stent made for newborn baby. Uh, the problem is making such a stent takes several weeks. It's extremely expensive. It's not something that is available when you need it, only for very long planning. And then again in those days, this was 1993, I did many things that uh, yeah, let me say, once made me famous and would get me into jail today. Because what I did, I just took some stands, glued them together. Uh, the uh, material was from Home Depot. And in those days, it was relatively easy. Now, legal hurdles are just too big. Uh, there are some intermediate steps where I had companies glue stand parts together or, for example, created sealing rings around this stand for fistulas. So these are moderate modifications that are still uh, within the range of the product. It is still a bifurcated stand. And this is what I'm doing uh, today. For example, this was last week. Uh, this is a stand for an upper lobe bronchus. I cut it, so I took the original stand, cut it, and uh, squeeze it a little bit so that it uh, did fit in into the bronchus intermedius, into the upper lobe bronchus. Again, this is modifying an existing stent. The real step forward would be like this. You see me here with my first 3D printer and with the prototypes. With 3D printing, you can actually build a stent or whatever you like from scratch. There are several techniques, optical techniques, or the technique that I show here, where basically you have a polymeric filament, you heat it up, and the nozzle goes uh, in a specific pattern, and then you create uh, such a stent from basically nothing. And uh, with such a technique, you uh, can see here, you can print within several hours, sometimes even minutes, whatever is needed. And this is the message. If you can imagine it, you can print it. There are many flexible materials uh, that are appropriate. None of them does have uh, medical uh, or approval for medical implants. I come to back to that later. So over the years, I've played with all kinds of materials uh, and uh, with modification of the surface. Let me show you what is possible. You cannot only make, for example, this uh, hourglass-shaped stent with a flat posterior membrane. You can even change the wall thickness, as you see here, so that at some points it's stiffer than at others. Again, you can create whatever is necessary. This is a typical clinical scenario, a stenosis uh, of the uh, trachea, total uh, torsion, kinking, whatever. Uh, we can plan it on the computer. Within half an hour, you have the perfect model. Uh, then it's printed, takes another two hours, and then you have a stand that can be implanted. 
fantastic techniques. You can even uh, modify the surface. On the left side, you see in an electron microscope, you see on, the, on the, uh, this part, this is the untreated stent, and you can uh, uh, spray with other polymers over it, and you have a very smooth surface. So, fascinating technique. The material that is used for most stents is silicone. You see on the left side a polymer, a thermoplast that can be melted. Silicon you cannot melt, so you cannot print directly with silicon. What we have done are we started with polymer or printed polymers like this tracheal shaped thing, dipped it into a silicone, and then had this, uh, uh, yeah, I would say surface uh, of the uh, original cast and. Uh, it remained the shape. You see, for example, and you see this several times in my presentation, the, the extra orifice there, this is the uh, tracheal bronchus for pigs uh, for the animal experiments. Taking this a step further, uh, we can make molds where uh, we print the inner and the outer part, put them together, put the silicone in, and a couple of hours later, you have the perfect silicone stent. Uh, these are typical examples of uh, stents for animals. This is Hervé Dutou, uh, where we placed the first, uh, uh, say first in pig in Marseille in 1916, or 2016. So, technically feasible. And since then, I have modified the technique in several ways to speed it up and uh, make it uh, better. So with these printed and molded polymeric stents, you can, as I said, produce anything. And this still takes about a week until we have a sterilized product, which is much faster and better than what we had in the past. But still, there are seven days. I mean, patient comes in short of breath, and we want to do something. So we try to make it even faster. But this is uh, becoming standard of care, uh, as the material that is used is kind of, uh, yeah, I would say, legally manageable. Because if you use medical grade silicone and do it in a clean room at a company, then uh, you can say, okay, I did the legal thing when I implanted it. Uh, uh, George Cheng, for example, has a, a service in the US uh, you send him a fax, and uh, he'll send you that type of stent. We print our stents ourselves or work with other companies. Uh, this is Tom Gildea, uh, presented a couple of years ago, uh, the Cleveland experiment. Uh, and in Cleveland, they have the service where they go to an orthopedic company, they do the construction, they make the molds, and within a few days, he has the stents. This is the French group. Uh, from Nicolas Schubert. Uh, they do it for very critical cases after lung transplantation. Again, customized stents. The first long-time results are showing up, and long-term means one-year follow-up. Now we are in two years, so it's doable, and it has been shown uh, that uh, this is clinically practical and logistically practical. Uh, and I bet that eventually it will become kind of standard of care. Now, the uh, last uh, paper, uh, the Blue Journal from uh, uh, the Toulouse group showed that 20 patients have successfully treated without major complications. These types of stents cannot only be used for uh, dealing with obstruction, but for example, sealing fistulas. This is a case where um, the patient underwent surgery, and uh, the blue arrow shows a hole, and this hole is a fistula between the bronchus and the stomach, so a bronchogastric fistula. And you see the uh, weird shape. When we reconstruct it, uh, you see that no normal stent would fit. You cannot put a stent into the stomach. Uh, nothing would fit here. So I printed uh, a tapered uh, stent uh, with sealing rings. 
And this is after implantation. On the left side, you see the view from the bronchus. On the right side, you see the view from the esophagus. And you cannot see the ceiling rings. So the symptoms stopped. Patients died later on brain metastasis, but it's a proof that it's doable. Let me talk a little bit more about biomechanics. When uh, you have a mesh type stand and a metal stand and squeeze them, they can feel identical. So the expansion force of these stands uh, are the same. However, biomechanically, it makes a big difference. This is the uh, vascular system of the trachea and is very tricky. You see that there are many tiny vessels and if you take a look at, sorry I don't have a pointer, that's why I'm writing back and forth, but if you see here uh, where I said blood vessels, the whole uh, distance from here to here, the mucosa, is just one millimeter. The trachea mucosa is not a big thing, it's one millimeter. And within this one millimeter you have uh, less than a tenth of a millimeter, a vessel just below the surface. And if now a stent squeezes on the surface, you diminish the perfusion and this results in fibrosis. Uh, on the upper part, I've shown what a wire would do, causing pinpoint pressure, and I've shown the images in the beginning uh, where you have all this granulation tissue. If we could distribute the expansion force a little bit better, chances that uh, uh, granulation tissue would develop are lower. This is the rationale for making or printing uh, polymeric stents that are not sharp as wires but have smooth struts. We tried this with 3D printing and you see it's very easy to print something that is flat, that has a uh, mesh structure, like the stents. But if you try to print thin-walled, tiny, standing stents, um, at least I failed. And I've tried that for years. So we had to come up with something better. Uh, and this is what I'm showing here. I print the stent first and then use a laser cutter with specific patterns to cut patterns or grids into the stand with argon gas a little bit and then you see the cut stands. So we make on the computer the pattern and then cut it out and uh, with that we can have all kinds of mesh type stands anatomically shaped. The bottom you see an anatomically shaped stand and the uh, diamond cutouts uh, adjust the, uh, let's say, the, the recoil uh, expansion force of the stent. There are other techniques, optical techniques, called photopolymerization, which is a nicer technique. However, we have not been able to get the material that can be photopolymerized uh, and that is not cytotoxic. It might come. Few more aspects. As you see here, uh, we changed the shape over the length and we also changed the wall thickness and uh, the cutter uh, pattern. So with this, we have biomechanically optimized stents. But there are more problems associated with stents. One problem is the rema uh, remaining problem is the mucus accumulation. So on the surface of any stent, you can have this nasty sticking uh, material, uh, which, by the way, had to be removed in that case with a cryoprobe. One way to overcome this would be nano coating of the surface. Uh, you know the techniques from the windshields of your car have some spray, and all wet will just uh, go away or drip away. We can do the same thing with stents. Unfortunately, the fantastic spray is approved for my car window, but not for my patients. I use it anyway, uh, but let's see what happens. Third problem is formation of granulation tissue. I've uh, shown these images before uh, when it comes to local perfusion pressure. Uh, 
One way to overcome this would be to give cytotoxic drugs. Uh, this is an old paper of us where we tested uh, how we can suppress the growth of fibroblasts and deposition of collagen uh, with the materials uh, that had been mentioned before by Bertram this morning, uh, which is serolimus and uh, pyrfinidone and so forth. So the same stuff that is used to deal with interstitial uh, lung diseases can be used locally to suppress granulation tissue formation. Also immune modulating agents. Let me show what we can do. We tested the response of granulation tissue to some drugs, and then I bring the these drugs on the surface of the printed stent. So you see the printed stent here, it's spinning, and in the syringe is a cytotoxic drug, and the whole thing takes place under 20,000 volts. So this is electro spinning. We may basically make from this liquid nanofibers. Uh, they are loaded with, for example, mitomycin, or if we deal with infection with antibiotics, and they are put on the surface. The charm is, while the surface of the stent has a surface area of 40 square centimeters, the surface of these nanofibers on the same stent uh, is 1,000 times bigger because the fibers are so thin. So you can have a very nice drug release uh, pattern over several months. Again, experimental stuff. So customized drug releasing stents would be we print them with a flexible PLA, laser cut them, and then uh, surface treat them with uh, drug eluting substances. The beauty of this technique is illustrated here. On the left upper part, you see a pig. This is in Greece where I do my animal experiment. You see a pig. We get the CT from the pig. Within 24 hours, I print the stent, finalize it, and, and this is 24 hours later where you see the perfectly matching stent uh, in situ. And again, doable. Final part, everybody's looking for biodegradable stuff. There are very few papers about biodegradable stents. Everybody's talking about it, but you see less than 20 patients have been treated so far worldwide. Reason is that these materials are not so easy to deal with. Uh, this is uh, the only stent, the uh, ELA stent, that we can use in Germany and Switzerland, but it's a brittle material and it's impossible to print it. We are working on printable material, as you can see here, which is dissolving over time, where we put some patterns in, uh, in order to avoid clogging of the bronchus. So it's a combination of absorbable material and uh, the uh, production techniques. Finally, there is time. And we know that over time, everything changes. Uh, and this would be the next step, which would be called 4D printing. 4D means that the stent changes over time. There are papers, and I start with very simple things. This is a stent, uh, which is made of a material that within several weeks is changing, because the outer ring is dissolving. So this would be when you put it into a tight stenosis and within the next few days it will expand. Theoretically, if this concept works, you can use it for kids. Kids are growing, stenosis is not growing, so it would grow with a kid. The other thing would be that you make the stent shrink so that you can remove it. So with these smart materials, everything is possible. Few little aspects clinically uh, before I finish up. Who should make the stents and who should decide how they should look like? We are pulmonologists, we get images from radiology. For example, this one here. And then we see the tiny hole here, the big tracheal part there. If we just use the CT data to make a mold, uh, it would look like this this would not help the patient. 
If you look into an anatomical book, you would want to have something like this. The trick is to find a reasonable compromise. You will never get that into a stenosis. If you put that in, it will not help the patient. So we as a pulmonologist have to decide how it should look like and make a reasonable compromise. That's why you cannot simply send the data to a company expecting them to send the perfect stent. We have to tell them, okay, I want some expansion force here, slightly smaller there. And the last aspect, eventually we have to put it into the patient. It's a good idea to have a fantastic stent, but if you cannot implant it. And this is uh, my last part here. I'm now working on deployment instruments. So here, for example, from the CT, I make a cast of the real trachea. So this is not the stand, this is the trachea. And then I practice how I can get the stand in. And in that case, for example, for this patient, I made myself a round shaped uh, or slightly curved uh, deployment instruments. Otherwise, we would not have been able to get it in. And these instruments can be made with the same technique uh, as the stent. So within a couple of days, you cannot only have the perfect stand, you can have the perfect instrument and even practice before you go to the patient in such a model. So what is possible today? We can have anatomically shaped, soft, tissue friendly, elastoplastic adapting, coated with individualized drugs stents. They can be fully or partially degradable. They can be produced within days. And custom devices can be made. So why don't we do it? Unfortunately, we have regulations. These are the regulations for Europe. And in May 26, uh, it will be uh, come into final uh, place. And it says, the new regulations of, uh, uh, make it, despite the fact that they're clinically useful, make it more dis, uh, uh, complicated. This could greatly impede the production of patient-specific implants, despite the fact that they have read, uh, repeatedly been demonstrated to have positive clinical effects. So, <laughs> not complaining, it's a tragedy of my life. Now, after 30 years of, I have finally the technology that I had ever been dreaming of to make the perfect stand, and now I'm not allowed to use it anymore. Uh, there are other countries which take it a little bit easier. This is uh, in Venshu, uh, where they have now created a lab for this personalized medicine, and they are more than happy to try things out supported by the government. Before uh, I finish, um, I'd like to show you uh, a few seconds video clip, uh, which I found so uh, amazing that I have to show it here. Uh, it was eight weeks ago in science, um, and they have shown this. Why should we try to make a stent why don't we just make a whole lung? And this is state of the art. Uh, the American colleagues have uh, shown here, and uh, we'll uh, see it in a few seconds, that it's possible to uh, deprint parts of the lung that are actually breathing and uh, oxygen supporting. This is a hydrogel. These are the alveolar ducts, and you, you see red blood coming in, hypoxic, disoxygenated blood, and at the outer outlet, this is oxygenated blood. The size of this cube is like this, so it's a beginning, but it's coming. And I think, give it another few years, and we can just print a lung, and uh, don't have to worry about the pharmaceutical companies. Uh, so the summary, despite great progress, we have problems which can only be solved by interventional bronchology. New techniques, the marriage of material science, tissue engineering, pharmacology, and additive manufacturing enable creating problem and patient-specific uh, devices. Truly customized stents are probably better than anything that we have. 
customized deployment devices can also be made. At present, regulatory hurdles are mildly speaking discouraging. However, progress will prevail. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Freitag, for the very interesting, the revolution and uh, the new classes in STEMs. It's like the dentist. We are like the dentist now. We can go, you know, for the dentist, and in 45 minutes, he can give you uh, the crown, which is suitable, personalized, for yeah. this, the same will be for a stent. Only one question is allowed, if any. Professor Halfawi again. Thank you, Dr. Freitag. And uh, what, what about the, the usual complications, the biofilm and stuff with the other stents? Okay, I'll answer that question in two years from now, I promise. Okay. <laughs> it's too early. Okay, thank you so much. Now I'll call for the uh, chairman for the next session, Plural Diseases, Professor Abdel Manam Rabia, Professor Ahmed Abdel Hafiz, Professor Kamal Maurice, Professor Amina Abdel Maqsoud, and Professor Khaled Hussein. Okay, Professor Matkura and myself will continue as a chairperson for this session. Uh, Professor Roseman, his flight actually uh, delayed. Hopefully, he will come tomorrow and present it at 9.45 a.m. It's my pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague the chairman of the organizing committee for this meeting, Professor Ahmed Al Halfawi. And Professor Ahmed Al Halfawi uh, will talk about the indwelling plural casters for malignant plural effusion, the Egyptian experience. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Um. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Adel, for pr presentation, and thank you everyone for attending the meeting. Um, I, I will try to be uh, as quick as possible to catch up with time. I will show. The, uh, so now the 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 guidelines for the management of malignant plural effusions entail that the the best practice now is to in, insert uh, uh, an indwelling catheter, a catheter that is placed, and the patient can go home on um, domiciliary treatment, then he can aspirate the fluid at home. Uh, let me first show you the picture of Cairo at night. It's a very nice, beautiful evening yesterday. And of course, Qasr Laini, our second home. So the, this year, we um, um, marks the 20th uh, anniversary of the indwelling catheter as we know it now. And the first publications was in 1999. Uh, uh, about the um, comparison between the indwelling catheter and doc doxycycline pleurodesis for the management of malignant pleural effusions, which was followed uh, the year after with the, uh, another uh, paper with the same group of uh, um, uh, physicians, outpatient management of malignant pleural effusion by a chronic indwelling pleural catheter. These were um, uh, essentially cardiothoracic surgeons in the center where I trained in the U.S., and I had the chance to... Uh, as, uh, uh, be present while they were working on these uh, papers. And the first, uh, the first publicity about the company was this picture when they showed the kids going home from school early and say, remember how it felt when they let you go home early? Th that's what they uh, planned for patients with malignant pleural effusion instead of admitting 
in hospital and keeping them in hospital for a long time, they let him go home now immediately. Um, this is the catheter, as we know, it's a, a silicon um, catheter um, um, that that is inserted. I won't show the insertion technique now. Uh, I'm sure you know in other, um, you've seen it in other presentations. But this is how it's designed to be drained using a, a, a vacuum bottle, plastic bottle that contains vacuum. And um, essentially, when you connect it to the to the tube from this side, the vacuum will aspirate the fluid. The, so this is a recent slide. The catheter sells for about 400 dollars with the insertion kits but the, but but to get 10 10 bottles is cost you 600 dollars so for a month's drainage <laughs> it's a huge amount for us and so um to use it here in egypt we i i, I designed the uh, i only made a very small modification and used the uh, commercially available uh, radio vac material it's a, a cheap product two dollars uh, the, the the pack and can be reused, it does not um, break. Uh, we disinfect it, so I have patients who have drained their caster for a month with a single um, uh, device like this. It's also very light, so a patient can carry it around. And, um, and since I placed my first caster here in Egypt in the year 2000, um, we used to get the, ca the, the catheters here because there was the, the, the company had a distributor here, now they don't have, so we have to um, bring them abro abroad or buy them somewhere else. I have now more than 320 catheters inserted. And um, um, when the company produced the, the, the catheter, they advised patients to drain the catheter whenever they, they were symptomatic, whenever they felt breathless or had a cough. And then now they're talking about aggressive drainage, which is a day-after-day -day protocol for drainage of these catheters. When I, had the, when I used the, the Sergevac, it was very um, uh, light, and, and um, we advised we designed a special protocol for uh, for um, draining these patients. We we called it continuous negative pressure drainage. So uh, the the drainage is a 500 milliliter um, uh, container. I asked my patients to drain them twice a day, w once in the morning, once before going to bed. And when the daily drainage is less than 500 milliliters, then it's less than the content of one. Um, one uh, container, the Sergevac, then I asked the patients to keep it connected all day, only to remove it when they go to sleep. And um, we had no major complications with this. We had, and in our first publication, we had a, a spontaneous pleurodesis rate of 76.3, um, that we think it was due to the continuous negative pressure and keeping the pleura dry at all times with a foreign body inside. And our, um, the, we removed the catheters after a mean of 19 days. Um, also the company would, um, uh, the, as with any other uh, intercoastal drainage, they would advise the, the removal of the catheter when the daily drainage is less than 200 milliliters. Um, I actually leave the catheter until it's dry, completely dry. And, and, and this is what we published in 2008, Dr. Light and I. And um, um, we were, at that time, we had 76% um, uh, um, spontaneous pleurodesis. The, the, it was published in Respirology, and they had a, uh, it was included in a year in review at that time. Um, I also used the catheter during thoracoscopy. And so now I can perform the thoracoscopy for undiagnosed pleural effusion, and if it's malignant, then I place the catheter, I, remo I, I send the patient home on the same day. I presented that in 2005, and now it's a common um, uh, practice. Um, I, I'll show you some data, um, unpublished data, that I'm working on with Dr. Light. Now, I have like 321 patient uh, catheters inserted in 317 one, uh, patients. Uh, one patient had two catheters at the same time, and the others had one removed and the other remo placed on the other side. 
most, most patients uh, in, in our case series are breast cancer patients and maybe uh, that would alter, uh, give us the, uh, um, explain why the, the rates of, uh, of spontaneous pleurodesis is, is high because now with the advances in treatment of breast cancer, we see a lot of patients cured from the malignant pleural effusion. We have around 78% spontaneous pleurodesis and our mean duration of drainage is 28.6 days. Um, um, we've also used the catheter and a few other non-malignant indications, but today we talk about indications in, in malignant pleural effusions. Um, and so to conclude, the catheter is a valuable therapeutic option for the management of malignant pleural effusion. Um, our experience in Egypt is a bit different, maybe due to the financial and um, financial cost of the devices used. We used the um, Sergevac device, very cheap. We used the continuous negative drainage for, uh, for draining these catheters. I, st I removed the catheter after complete stoppage of the drainage with very high results of pleurodesis. And with this, I thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Halafawi, for your uh, experience in, uh, in doing pleural catheter. As you all know, Professor Halafawi is one of the leaders of uh, pleural disease and thoracoscopy in Egypt, and he started the workshops with us in uh, the Bronchology Society since uh, 2002, and we thank him for his efforts in this area. And now we shift uh, to uh, the symposium, Sanofi Symposium. We are delighted to uh, call for Professor Yasser Mustafa, Chairman of Chess Department and Champs University. Uh, he is going to speak about uh, Community Acquired Pneumonia Management Update 2019. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Thank you very much. بشكر الحقيقة الدكتور أحمد حلفاوي وجروب الأصل العيني على المجهود الجميل والملموس الحقيقة بزلو. إحنا كلنا وأنتي من الحقيقة في الجمعية وبنشكر مشاركة حضراتكم معنا لأن هو ده اللي بينجح المؤتمر. My talk today will be about some recent issues in management of CAP. Uh, and my agenda will contain an overview about CAB with special concern of epidemiological aspects and updates in assessment and uh, uh, recent guidelines in treatment of CAB. Uh, community acquired pneumonia is one of the uh, everyday uh, work and everyday practice in uh, respiratory branch and also in internal medicine, in ER, so it is very important uh, to be updated from time to time. Uh, as you know that uh, pneumonia is acute infection or inflammation of the lung parenchyma characterized by clinical and radiological signs of uh, consolidation and we classified uh, from many aspects, maybe anatomical and radiological uh, like loper pneumonia or uh, bronchopneumonia or even interstitial Pneumonia. Can we classify it according to the etiology into bacterial, viral, fungal, and even sometimes chemical or physical like radiation pneumonites? Uh, can, we, we can, can we classify it, which is very important, according to the setting of infection, either to community acquired pneumonia, hospital acquired pneumonia, or even inside the hospital in patient under mechanical ventilation into ventilator assisted pneumonia with a special concern of aspiration and special concern in immunocompromised patients. My talk today will be about the community acquired pneumonia, the very important issue. It is the infection of the lung parenchyma in a person who is not hospitalized or living in a long-term care facility for more than two weeks. 
develops in the outpatient setting or within 48 hours of hospital admission للي دخل المستشفى عشان يعمل اي حاجه تانيه. The community acquired pneumonia is still one of the very important diseases which causes uh, mortality. It is the sixth leading cause of death from infectious disease. It is number one, up to 5.6 million cases per year uh, have a morbidity from pneumonia, more than 10 million physician visits, and 1.1 million hospitalization, with a mortality in outpatient cases less than 1%, still in patients with mild pneumonia and treated as outpatient had a percent of mortality. And in admitted patients, if they need admission in ward, it may reach up to 14% mortality, and if they need ICU admission, it may reach up to 40% uh, mortality. The pathogenesis and pathogens causing pneumonia uh, can reach to the lung either by inhalation, which is the uh, most common way, maybe through aspiration or through the blood, and this is a special entity of pneumonia, pyemic lung abscess, and maybe invasion from adjacent infected structures like osteomyelitis of rib or something like that. If we look for the organism, we will find that in all settings of community acquired pneumonia, in patients treated in home or ICU or uh, outside ICU, uh, we have a common participant, which is the streptococcus pneumoniae. Streptococcus pneumoniae chair in most of these cases, or nearly more than 80 to 90 percent, together with atypical organisms. That's why in the last two decades, we uh, usually, in all guidelines, need to cover the atypical organisms like Mycoplasma, Legionella, and Chlamydia when we are treating uh, a case of pneumonia. Uh, not commonly to have staph and gram-negative bacilli, especially in some severe cases which needs ICU admission. The diagnosis of pneumonia depend primarily on the clinical features, as you know, documented by the X-ray and may be supported by some tests. The clinical picture, usually, uh, in, in many cases, especially in the start of the disease, non-specific pictures or non-specific uh, symptoms like cough, expectoration, permanent sputum, dyspnea, fever, altered mental state, vomiting or diarrhea or skin rash in some cases, and generally we have hypothermia or fever, we have uh, local signs of uh, consolidation. X-ray in community acquired pneumonia is very important. At first, to establish the diagnosis and then to evaluate the severity, for example, if it is extensive pneumonia or it is bilateral pneumonia, may help us to find a coexisting condition like bronchial obstruction, we can find a collapse, or a presence of lung abscess in cases of staph pneumonia and necrotizing pneumonia to also help us in the definition of the pattern of pneumonia, which may give us an idea about the etiology. For example, if it is lower, usually it is streptococcus pneumonia. If it is patchy, usually it is atypical. If it is interstitial, usually it is viral or pneumocystis If it is cavitary, usually it is necrotizing pneumonia like staph or gram-negative enterobacterici with differential diagnosis of TB, don't forget TB. And if it is accompanied by large effusion, we think about staph and gram-negative organism. These are some pictures of cases of uh, local pneumonia. This is necrotizing pneumonia. Uh, sometimes we need to do a CT scan to exclude another pathology or concomitant disease not to confirm the diagnosis of pneumonia. CT scan is not indicated in pneumonia per se uh, in uh, assessment. A diagnostic test uh, may be needed in some cases. It is a controversial issue. If the patient will be treated in outpatient setting, usually we don't need any test to do. If the patient needs hospital advice, uh, hospital admission, especially if he's critically ill patient, usually we do blood culture, sputum culture, and general test, other tests. We may have at first sputum, stain, and culture, blood culture, as I mentioned. Sometimes we need to do oxygen saturation to assess the patient's severity or the condition severity from the start uh, in order to take a decision how to care about this patient. Sometimes we need a lab like blood cell count, CRP, pancreatinine, 
as we see in assessment, we need to know the pun of the patient because it enters in some assessment criteria. Sometimes, especially in patients admitted in ICU, we may need to do a bronchoscope and bronchoalveolar lavage to exclude other pathology or to take a, a representative sample for culture and sensitivity and bacteriological workup. Uh, sputum, the organism is not detected except in 50% of cases. And to tell that this is a representative sample, it should contain less than 10% epithelial cells and more than 25 polymorph nuclear cells per, per low power field. It is very useful to do a gram stain, and uh, our eminent professor, Dr. Mukhtar Matkur, when I was a resident, he learned us to send a sample to the lab quickly, tell me by the end of the day it is gram positive or gram negative. So I can direct my antibiotic therapy accordingly. No need to cover the gram negative organism by antibiotic while I have a pure gram positive till the culture finished. Also, it can help us when we find many pus cells without organism. This may be atypical pneumonia. Sputum culture sensitivity and specificity is low, and usually we need to make a, a quantitative culture, not a qualitative culture, and we should use it in patients admitted to hospital and the ICU. And don't forget that we are a country endemic in tuberculosis, so when we collect sputum, we have to send for acid fast bacilli. We have a recent test which are very specific and sensitive and at the same time give us a rapid result for knowing the organism. Usually we uh, uh, leave this test to a critical cases and special situation because they are very expensive, although they are rapid and accurate, like gene expert. We used to do it in tuberculosis, but gene expert is present in other uh, bacteria and we, uh, through it, we can know even the gene responsible for the resistance of some types of bacteria, and this helps us a lot in directing therapy. Uh, sometimes we have a sample from PAL, bronchoalveolar lavage, uh, through the bronchoscope. Sometimes in, in certain situations, we may need to need a protected specimen brush sample in order to take a representative samples uh, in patient and sensitive situations like immunocompromised patients and uh, cases like this. But very rarely to do this in CAB, except if it is complicated later on. And now we are going to go to management of CAB. Uh, we have to decide at first uh, where to treat my patient, in home, in hospital, or an ICU. This is a very important issue. Uh, we have to know from the start. Don't underestimate and don't overestimate the case. So the, we are going to depend mainly on clinical assessment. As much as I can depend on the clinical assessment, I will be more practical. As much as I be far from lab or investigations, I will be more practical. But sometimes I need lab and the radiology to help me in my assessment and my scoring system. We have many scoring system, pneumonia severity index score, CURB 65 score, and severity criteria for ICU admission. CURB 65 score is one of the very practical scoring system help us and it was uh, tested many times and many uh, publications on it uh, that it can direct us, it can give us an idea about the expected mortality and morbidity of the patient and so can tell us where to treat my patients in hospital or in home or in ICU. Depend on five aspects, confusion, for C, U, for BAN, R, for respiratory rate, P, for blood pressure, and uh, 65 for age, 65 or more. Because they found that, as I will mention later on, with this age and more, uh, the mortality from pneumonia increase. If I have no or one of these, I have a mortality of 1 to 1.5%, so I can treat my patient in home, uh, but with a special concern to follow up this patient after two or three days because he may go to CURB 2 or 3 and he need hospital admission. CURB 2 mortality 9%, short or hospital or supervised outpatient. CURB 3, 22% inpatient admission with consideration for ICU admission if the patient jump to CURB 4 or 5. This study show us uh, the impact of age on the survival after CAP. As we, as we observe here with age, 
with advance of age above 50, uh, 65 years, the, uh, the mortality increase from community acquired pneumonia. So age 65 or more is even important issue in assessment. To be more practical, we need a, a scoring system without lab. We need to remove you. We don't need to make a urea test. Uh, so uh, CRB 65 was tested, and it was a little bit effective in assessment uh, of morbidity and mortality. So it is the same, but without you. But uh, recently, add to it two another points, which are the S criterion for oxygen saturation and the D criterion for comorbidity, and this was tested as a predictor for mortality and, and morbidity and was published in 2015, and it was found that it is a good prognostic accuracy for this CURB 65 DS system in assessment of patient severity from pneumonia. Severity assessment to guide ICU admission depends on major criteria. If you find one of them, of, of these two, we have to admit the patient, respiratory failure or uh, septic shock and severe sepsis needs vasopressor, or uh, more than three of the minor criteria, including respiratory rate, uh, PO2 over FiO2, uh, patients with have multi-loper involvement, confusion, uremia, leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, hypothermia, hypotension, high pan, low white blood cell count, and uh, hypothermia. All these are minor criteria. If we find three or more, it is better to admit the patient to ICU. Now we will move to treatment. How to treat patients with community acquired pneumonia after we diagnose him, after we assess him and put him in his criterion, I have to choose the proper management of these patients. All the guidelines speak about when, whom, how, and for how long. Uh, we have a general measures, general supportive measures. We have main, uh, two major arms the general supportive measures and the antibiotics. The general supportive measures depend on fluid and diet, uh, antiemetic if the patient has vomiting, for example, antipyretic, cough syrup, oxygen therapy if the patient is hypoxic, and treatment of comorbidity is a very important uh, issue. The antibiotic is still, uh, all the guidelines depend on empirical choose of antibiotic, but upon depending upon evidence-based criteria for choosing the antibiotic, uh, respecting the antibiogram of the area where we treated our patient, and the, uh, the incidence of resistant streptococcus, and to learn physicians how to suspect multi-resistant streptococci in order to choose the proper antibiotic empirically. So the prompt initiation of appropriate antibiotic therapy is crucial. Uh, empirical antimicrobial should be started as soon as diagnosis of pneumonia is made, and factors related to organism, the patient, and the antibiotic, antibiotic should be considered. For example, if the patient has vomiting, I should admit him for IV or a parenteral antibiotic. Uh, we have uh, some criteria to suspect if the patient has resistant strains of streptococcus. For example, if he used many broad spectrum beta-lactam antibiotics within the last three months, if the patient is immunocompromised, if the patient is working in a home, in, in, in a home care facility, uh, in, in a hospital care facility units. So all these patients, if they got pneumonia, I should think about resistant strains of streptococcus pneumonia so I can uh, 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 choose from the start the good antibiotic. Uh, this paper shows the importance of early treatment and uh, it was uh, concluded that cap delay to more than four hours starting antibiotic increase mortality and increase length of hospital stay. So we have to start as early as we can. Recently, we have uh, many guidelines. Uh, we have the ITSA guidelines for outpatient community acquired pneumonia 2014. We have the Egyptian consensus statement uh, we uh, founded in 2012, uh, depending on 
experience of many expertise in different aspects, pulmonologist, pediatrician, ICU, and on some papers uh, which was published about the resistant pattern of streptococcus in Egypt, and uh, on also the guidelines, uh, the, the worldwide or the international guidelines, we use it with some modification. Very recently, in 2019, we have the NICE of the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence uh, Pneumonia Community Acquired uh, Antibicropial Prescribing uh, Guidelines. Uh, for our society, because this is the conference of our society, I started with our recommendations for treatment of CAP. If the patient in the session of outpatient treatment, uh, so we start with oral respiratory fluoroquinolones because we observe it that uh, the, strain, the, the resistance to beta-lactam, beta-lactamase antibiotics was increasing in the last 10 years. But if the patient has contraindication to use fluoroquinolone or use it already within the last three months, which we should it, uh, choose another antibiotic, we recommend oral beta-lactam, beta-lactamase, plus oral new macrolides like adesromycin or clarisromycin in order to cover the atypical microorganism which has no cell wall. Or we respect the local circumstances. It is, I think, it is the only country all over the world where the patient can give an uh, intramuscular injection in the pharmacy or in the home. So we, Radina or Abaina, he, the patient will do this, okay? So we put in, we try to put it in the guidelines in order to uh, direct the physicians who when to use it, not to use it uh, empirically because of the resistance of the third generation used like Ciftraxon because of it is accessibility and easy intake once daily will transfer the resistance to the other group for sorry. So we recommend intramuscular third generation cephalosporins in certain cases with new macrolides. In patient with non-ICU admission, intravenous IV respiratory fluoroquinolones, we recommend it, or IV beta-lactam, beta-lactamase plus IV new macrolides, or IV third generation cephalosporins plus IV new macrolide. In patient treated in ICU as a rule, no monotherapy, we choose IV respiratory fluoroquinolones with third or fourth generation cephalosporins, or IV imipenem plus IV new macrolides, propose that there is no risk for pseudomonas. If there is a risk for pseudomonas, there is another issue. What about the doses from the start? From 2012, we recommend levofloxacin in a dose of 750. After that, many uh, international guidelines recommend the same dose. At that time, it was 500 milligram only. The respiratory fluoroquinolones levofloxacin 750 milligram every 24 hours, or GIMI or norfloxacin, moxifloxacin, sorry, beta-lactam, beta-lactamase, amoxacin, and clav one gram every eight to 12 hours, new macrolides, azithromycin 500 milligram every 24 hours, or clarithromycin 500 milligram every 12 hours. For the patient admitted in hospital and recommend for them IV uh, levofloxacin from 12, 2012, we recommend a dose of 500 milligram every 12 hour, which was recommended now by NICE in 2019. Uh, uh, for us in Egypt, in practice in Egypt, we recommended that uh, since our consensus guidelines, uh, 12 hourly. The most recent, which is NICE guideline, uh, they classify the patient according, uh, it is mild pneumonia, Severity or moderate severity or severe, very severe. And uh, furtherly classified each group into patients who are sensitive, uh, patients who are no problem with using beta lactam uh, antibiotics like uh, penicillins, and patients who have contraindication to use this group. So they recommend amoxicillin in treatment of pneumonia. Mild cases, I think, in our country, it will not work at all as an alternative oral antibiotic in patients contraindicated to take penicillin, we have doxycycline or clarithromycin or erythromycin, uh, which can be also used in pregnancy. Uh, for patients with moderate severity, uh, we recommend amoxicillin uh, with uh, 
if a typical organism is suspected, we will add clarithromycin or erythromycin in patients with high sensitivity or uh, com uh, complication from penicillins or allergy. We recommend also doxycycline and clarithromycin. In severe cases, based on clinical judgment and guided by CRB65 score 3 or 4, guided by microbiological results when available, a co-amoxicillin, they hear the, the, that's why the patients stick to guidelines, that's why they have no resistance, but here co-amoxicillin is used in everyday practice in any disease. Uh, we recommend the dose 500, 125 milligrams three times daily, clarithromycin or uh, erythromycin uh, if a typical organism is uh, suspected. But in severe cases, they recommend levofloxacin in 500 milligram twice daily, either orally, if the patient can swallow it orally, or intravenously, but this is the dose recommended by NICE in 2019 for management of severe community acquired pneumonia. Uh, the Spanish Society of Pulmonology and Thoracic Surgery, uh, it considered from the Mediterranean country and it is uh, near uh, to us, that's why sometimes we, uh, we, we feel that we are uh, in, in their practice, uh, near uh, to our practice. Uh, so in outpatient treatment of pneumonia, they recommend the first respiratory fluorokinolones, unlike other uh, countries or other guidelines, the British and NICE, moxifloxacin or levofloxacin, and in treatment of patients admitted in hospital, also still they recommend levofloxacin in monotherapy. In patients admitted in ICU, they recommend levofloxacin, as you see, intravenously 500 every 12 hours. So they nearly very near to us, and in patients suspected pseudomonas erigenosa, they have a special concern, as I mentioned before. How, when to switch from intravenous to oral therapy when the patient become febrile, no abnormal GIT absorption, cough and respiratory distress improved, white blood cell returning normal. Uh, the duration of therapy, a minimum of five days, uh, the patient should be febrile for 48 to 72 hours uh, uh, before switching uh, or before stopping the antibiotic, no more than one cap associated sign of clinical instability, which are temperature, heart rate, respiratory rate, systolic blood pressure, arterial oxygen tension, ability to maintain oral intake and normal mental states. To take home message, uh, pneumonia is one of the most fatal infectious disease, although the advance in antibiotic and the guidelines the role of inflammation, which is not the uh, place to speak about here, but uh, when we think about why pneumonia kill people, pneumonia kill people because of the inflammatory cascade which follow the entrance of the organism to the body and the battle which happened between the immune system and the body with the release of many cytokines, these are the problem. So to monitor the inflammation is now the concern of many researchers in this area in the, in the last 10 years and to uh, give an anti-inflammatory drug in order to uh, decrease the rate of, immune, of, of mortality from pneumonia is another issue, although it has not succeeded up to now, but it is going on in many research. The role of inflammation which happens with pneumonia should be carefully studied, and the abuse of antibiotics should be inhibited by increasing the awareness of people and physicians about the size of the problem with emerging of lethal resistant strains. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Yasser. Any question? ثانية واحدة يا فندم هيجيبوا لحضرتك ميكروفون ميكروفون لو سمحت يا ميكروفون لو سمحت هو حضرتك قلت ان هو في الـ investigations no need for much investigations امتى اعمل سيريولوجيكال تيست؟ uh, investigations معينة تقصدي يعني sputum culture مثلا أو blood culture ولا in general؟ يعني امتى أقول أنا يستحسن من البداية إن أنا أعمل سيريولوجيكال فور أتيبيكال نيمونيا أو 
يعني when when uh, th that's why i mentioned in my uh, talk that uh, if the pa my patient has mild or mild to moderate pneumonia and i decide to treat this patient in home don't let him to come after one week please let him to come after two or three days because this patient may deteriorate and according to the pattern of deterioration for example no response to antibiotic the symptoms increase the fever don't want to drop i have to resort to uh, investigations. Uh, the investigations will uh, vary from simple sputum culture, blood culture in some cases, uh, pl uh, white blood cell and CRB to follow the inflammatory pattern of the disease. Uh, and if I have the chest x-ray with an unusual pattern of a presentation, for example, patchy pneumonia, bilateral, interstitial, I can at that time resort to serology tests for a typical microorganism. Now I have also to think about fungus, fungal infection in certain situations. We have in the morning uh, two talks about the fungus and the presence of fungus, special aspergillus in the community. Uh, that's why this will depend on the experience of the physician. That's why when we learn our uh, primary care physicians to treat pneumonia, they should learn them when to transfer the patient to specialist. The internal, uh, our colleagues from the internal medicine department or primary care physicians, they can treat pneumonia with low severity, but they have to follow the patient after two or three days, and they should learn when to transfer the patient to a specialist. أو زي ما الدكتور ياسر قال لو كان في سسبكتد انيوجوال اورجانيزم ده انديكيشن ان احنا نعمل فيردر انفستيجيشن لكن از ا روتين تشست اكس راي از مانداتوري وعلى الكلينيكال بيزز وذاوت اني انفستيجيشنز لو كان في الكوميونتي في الكوميونتي بيزز مش في الهوسبيتال ده ده كمان اللي قاله الاستاذ الدكتور ياسر واللي قاله الاستاذ الدكتور اشرف ده اكوردنج لللييتست جايد لاينز اي تي اس اتسا 2019 لسه طالعة من حوالي شهر ونص اكتوبر 2019 شكرا دكتور شكرا Now I'll call for the chairpersons for the second session which is AstraZeneca Symposium chairpersons Professor Ashraf Hatem, Professor Huda Abu Yusuf, Professor Hussein Ali Hussein, Professor Magdi Muhammad Ali, moderator Adel Khattab. <coughs> for the sake of time, may I call for the first speaker in this session, Professor Assam Gouda, Professor of Pulmonary Medicine Alexandria University. Professor Assam Haikalim on further paradoxes of asthma management, interactive clinical case. Dr. Ashraf, do you want to start with you? Because I'm not Dr. Assam. Okay. We'll start with Dr. Professor Ashraf Matkour. Professor Ashraf Matkour. هيتكلم على الاسمه towards better control وده through interactive clinical case اتفضل يا دكتور اشرف بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم في الاول طبعا بشكر استاذ الدكتور عادل الخطاب تشير بيرسون وبشكر طبعا استاذ الدكتور اشرف حاتم دكتور احمد الحلفاوي دكتور مصطفى الشاذلي واسم الصادر بالقصر العيني وبقيت زمايلي في الجمعيه وبشكر طبعا شركه استرازينيكا على دعوتي ان انا اشارك في السيمبوزيوم ده هم طلبوا مني ان اتكلم على الازمه تورز بيتر كنترول 
طبعا عارفين ان الجلوبال امباكت بتاعت الازمه از ا كومن از ا كومن كرونيك ريسبيراتوري ديزيز افكتنج 1 تو 18% اوف ذا بوبيوليشن في ديفرنت كانتريز البريفلنس از انكريزنج في الشيلدرن وفي الديفلوبينج كانتريز هو ميجر كوز للسكول والورك ابستنس والهيلث كير اكسبنديتشر از انكريزنج افري داي طبعا القصه الرئيسيه في الازمه هي الان كنترولد ازمه في الريل لايف ودي مشكله وفي ديفرنت سيرفيز اباوت نص البيشنتس على الانترناشونال ليفل داز نوت كنترول ذير ازما ففي سيرفي 2019 في اليو اس كان 41% اللي هم بيعملوا كنترول في اليوروبيان كانتريز في 2006 كان 55% وفي 2010 54% وال في الاستراليان سيرفي في 2015 46% هم اللي بيعملوا كنترول للازما طبعا في ليدنج ستادي كان معايا طبعا استاذ دكتور هشام طراف معانا فيها هو اللي كان المين برنسبل انفستيجيتور من ايجيبت واحنا شاركناه اللي هي الازمه كنترول في الميدل ايست اللي هي الازمه ستادي ودي كانت من ديفرنت كانتريز في الميدل ايست ريجن 700 306 بيشنس كانت في تقريبا 1050 ايجيبشن شيرد من الازمه ليفل كنترول في الميدل ايست في الميدل ايست في كل الكانتريز كانت الليفل اوف كنترول اونلي 29% هم اللي كنترول الان كنترولد كانوا 41% والبارشلي كنترول 29% ففي الحقيقه للاسف 30% فقط في كل الريجن وات اباوت ايجيبت ايجيبت كان الكنترولد 20% فقط كان في تقريبا 78% ان كنترولد او بارشلي كنترولد ودي رقم كبير جدا واقل من 25% اوف الايجيبشن بوبيوليشن كان عندها جود ادهرنس تو ذا تريتمنت وده يفسر ليه ان هو الليفل اوف كنترول كان واطي والكونسيبت في تو كونسيبتس في علاج الازمه اللي في البراكتس ان في ناس بتعتمد على البرونكو دايليتر وفي ناس بتكتب الانتي انفلاماتري وفي الاير سيرفي الاير سيرفي البرونكو دايليتر كان يوز 3 تايمز جريتر تسلم ايديك كانوا يوز 3 تايمز جريتر ذان الانتي انفلاماتري اوفر اللاست 4 ويكس وده بان حتى في الشيلدرن وبان كمان في الادلتس Uh, I want to share معاكم الاستادي دي عشان نقدر نعمل uh, يعني تطبيق على الـ على الـ قصه الكنترول مستر ام اي از 46 يير اولد ميل هو هاد بين دايجنوزد وذ ازما 12 ييرز بريفيسلي فور ذا باست يير هيز تيكينج لو دوز كورتيكوسترويد انهيلر هي بياخد بيدوزنايد 200 مايكروغرام وان باف twice daily and salbutamol inhaler as needed. Despite that, he suffered from waking up with asthma symptoms approximately twice a month and a day uh, time uh, symptoms in the form of chest tightness more than three times per week. He had also unscheduled asthma visit to his doctor, Wando exacerbation history uh, once in the last uh, year. Lispirometry during the last year can 80% of the predicted lol FEV1. Uh, he presented the clinic complaining of uh, wheezing uh, increase for the level of dyspnea grade. For the four days before the presentation, I can handle day symptoms in the form of infrequent chest tightness or attacks of night, cough three times per week. However, I can't handle limitation for daily activity. Of course, there are people outside, there are people underestimating the symptoms. Although that he claims that he's taking his controller inhaler regularly, but he realized increase in the frequency of salbutamol inhaler intake. He finished one salbutamol canister in the last three weeks and he started a new one last night. Well, comorbidities is that allergic rhinitis, but it is under control. The physical examination is vital and stable. The heart rate 67, the temperature 36, the blood pressure 110 over 70, respiratory rate 18, normal examination except for uh, bilateral and expiratory, expiratory civil and tronchial. Investigation liquid count 9,300, the neutrophils 72%, the eosinophils uh, 302, the ESR uh, 13, the FEV1 percentage predicted 65% of the predicted. طيب ازاي هنعمل اسسمنت تو ذيس كيس؟ اول حاجه احنا عشان تو اساس اوف كيس اوف ازمه عندنا بارامترز اللي من اساس اساس الكنترول ومن اساس التريتمنت ايشو والكوموربيدتيز عندنا تو تو دومينز عشان نقص ان نقدر نعمل بيهم الكنترول اللي هو الاساس الكنترول في اخر اربع اسابيع وريسك اوف بور اوت كمز وبالنسبه للتريتمنت ايشو بنشوف التشيكنج للبيشنت انهيلر تكنيك والادهرنس وهل في سايد افكتس ولا لا 
وهل هو معاه ريتن اكشن بلان اللي هي الروشته العاديه ممكن تخليها له اكشن بلان والجولز اوف الازمه تريتمنت مهم جدا الجولز بتاعت الازمه تريتمنت اللي العيان يبقى عارف الاهداف بتاعته عشان يقدر يوصل لها لان دايما البيشنت بيبقى اندر اكسبكتنج السيمتومز وباي حاجه بسيطه بتحسنه بيتقبلها فعشان يكون الجولز ان هو يبقى فيه سيمتوم كنترول ان هو عنده فيو سيمتومز وما فيش سليب ديستربنس ما فيش اكسرسايز ليميتيشن وعشان اعمل ريدكشن ريسك يبقى اللانج فانكشن مينتين اول ثرو على جود ليفل ما فيش اكسسربيشنز ما فيش ازمه ديسز ما فيش ميديكيشن سايد افكتس بعد كده دوت الكوموربيتيز فيري امبورتنت وكروشال ان انت تكنترول الكوموربيتيز زي ما هو الاريجيك راينيتس اللي عنده يعمل لها كنترول لكن ممكن يبقى في حاجات ثانيه زي الاوبيزيتي زي الجرد زي الابستراكتيف سليب ابنيا والديبريشن والانكزايتي لازم تبقى كنترول فا وات از هيز ازمه كنترول المفروض ان احنا هنا كان في فوتنج بقى مش عارف احنا عملنا هم طبعا مش واضح ان حد وزع الفوتنج بادز فطبعا هل البيشنت ده يعتبر ويل كنترولد ولا بارشلي كنترولد ولا ان كنترولد ازمه لو طبعا اكوردنجلي هو ان كنترولد ازمه ليه ان كنترولد لان احنا البيشنت ده عنده داي تايم سيمتومز اكتر من توايس ا ويك عنده نايت سيمتومز وعنده ريليفر اوفر يوز اوف ريليفر اكتر من توايس ا ويك لكن هو ما عندوش limitation للاكتيفيتي فالبيشنت ده عنده اكتر من ثلاثه يبقى ده ان كنترولد يبقى مستر ام ان ام اي ده ان كنترولد ازم طيب الازمه اكسسربيشن از اكسبكتد ليه العيان ده انا اكسبكتد على ان هو عنده ازمه اكسسربيشن بيزد اون اول اوف ذا فولوينج ريسك فاكتورز ليه يعني العيان ده اكسبكتنج ان هو عنده ازمه اكسسربيشن هل هو عشان عنده ان كنترولد سيمتومز ولا عنده هيستوري اوف اكسسربيشن في الباست يير ولا بور ادرنت يوز اوف انهيلر ولا لو اف اي في 1 Uh, 65% of predicted will high use of salvitamol. خلي بالكم ان هو الاجابه اكس اكسبت. هو هنا طبعا هي اكسبت اللي هي اللو اف اي في 1 برسنتج اوف بريدكتد لو هنبص واحده واحده كده عند العيان اول حاجه العيان عنده ان كنترول سيمتوم زي ما قلنا عنده هاي صابا يوز طبعا مخلص كانستر وابتدى في الثانيه في خلال شهر عنده اكسسربيشن في اخر شهر ثاني حاجه الاف اي في 1 هنا بتاعته مش هنا مش لو اف اي في 1 يعني هنا واصلة 65% من الـ predicted هنا لسه ما قلتش عن 60 الادرنس هنا البيشنت بيكليم ان الادرنس بتاعه كويس تاني حاجة ان البيشنت كمان هنا هو مفروض ان احنا نبص على الفاكتورز التانية يمكن الهيستري ما فيهوش قصة الاوبيزيتي ما فيهوش حاجات تانية لكن برضو لو كان في حاجة تانية يبقى العيان ده هي دي الريسك فاكتورز اللي خلت له عنده بور اوتكم وعشان كده اي واز اكسبكتنج ان البيشنت ده نتيجة ان هو بيستخدم الصابة كتير عنده اكسسربيشن قبل كده عنده انكنترولد سيمتومز ان هو بيكليم ان هو عنده ادهرنس ده بيخليه عرض اكتر ان هو ريسك فاكتور للازمه طيب تاني حاجه بعد كده عشان اشوف الليفل الاسسمنت بتاعه الازمه التشيك الانهيلر تكنيك هتشيك الانهيلر تكنيك ان هو بتقول له انت بتعرف تستخدم البخاخه ولا لا وتستخدم تشيك ليست للبخاخه تخلي العين يجيب البخاخه معاه وتشوف الديفايس سبيسيفيك تشيك ليست كل بخاخه في الدنيا ليها تشيك ليست وتشوف العين بيقدر يعمل الاسينشال ولا النون اسينشال كل بخاخه ليها اسينشال ونون اسينشال ستيبس لو ما عملش طبعا اسينشال ستيبس يبقى هو ما بيستخدمش البخاخه فدي مهم جدا ان احنا نعرف الاسينشال ونون اسينشال ستيبس بتاع كل بخاخه برضو من الحاجه الثانيه ان احنا حكايه المهم جدا ان نشوف البيشنت للادرنس ان احنا الكويشنز بتاعت الادرنس ما تبقاش سيمبل كويشنز وزي ما الجينا موضحه ان هو الامباثيك كويشنز ان انت بتسالهم اسئله غير موجهه هاو ماني دايز في الويك هاف يو بين تيكينج ات ما بتاخدهاش مره اثنين ثلاثه اربعه هل انت فايند ات ايزر ان انت تفتكرها الصبح او بالليل يعني مثل يعني كويشنز مش بطريقه مباشره عشان العيان طبعا اي حد تقول له بتاخد يقول لك باخد وبعمل وكل حاجه ثاني حاجه ان انت تقدر تسال لو في فرصه لو العيان بيصرف عن طريق شركه او حاجه تشوف الديت بتاعت اللاست كنترول البرسكريبشن او الديت والدوز بتاعت الكاونتر لو في فرصه كل دي هتقدر تعمل تشيك على الادرنس دي هتبقى مهمه بعد كده هوت الاساس الازمه سيفيريتي ان احنا طبعا دي بتت... زي ما انتم عارفين ان هي بت... بنعملها ريتروسبكتيف في اخر اربع اسابيع هو العيان ده كان بياخد لو دوز اي سي اس لكن المفروض عشان ابقى اقول ان هو مايلد ازمه يبقى ويل كنترول العيان ده ما كانش ويل كنترول آه لو كان ويل كنترول ده على الـ على الـ على اللو دوز يبقى ده هيبقى مايلد ازمه لو على ويل كنترول ده على اللو دوز اي سي اس لابا ده هيبقى مودريت ازمه لو هو سيفير هيبقى العيان بياخد ميديوم او هاي دوز اي سي اس يا اما بياخد العلاج ده وكنترولد عليه او ريمينز ان كنترولد عليه هنا العيان ده كان بياخد بالزنايد من 200 ل 400 فده يعتبر لو دوز لكن ان كنترولد فمعناها ان الليفل بتاعه الستيرويدز اللي بياخدها مش مناسبه للكونديشن بتاعته وهنا عشان كده مهم جدا ان احنا نفرق ما بين الثلاثه كونسبتس هل هو العيان ده ان كنترولد ازمه ولا ديفيكلت تو تريت ازمه ولا سيفير ازمه الان كنترولد ازمه ان واحد عنده حاجه من اثنين يا عنده بور سيمتوم كنترول يا عنده فريكونت اكسسربيشن البور سيمتوم كنترول يعني بيجي له اعراض كتيره 
بيستخدم الريليفر كتير ما بينهج بيزيق مش قادر يشوف الاكتيفيتي بتاعته بيقوم بالليل كتير او بيجي له اكسسربيشن اكتر من مرتين في السنه بتحتاج اورال كورتيكوسترويدز او واحده سيريس في السنه خليته يخش المستشفى ده اللي انكونترولد اسمه طب ديفيكلت تو تريت ازمه هو انكونترولد ازمه اكوردنج للجينا ستيب 4 و5 لكن عنده موديفايبل فاكتور ممكن نصلحها زي الانكوركت انهيلر تكنيك او البور ادهرنس او السموكينج او الكوموربيديتيز عشان نوصل لل ان هو يبقى ايه كنترول السيفير ازمه هو واحد في ستاب جينا 4 و5 والموديفايبل فاكتورز دي كلها قتلت بحثا والعيان كله بياخد الكون... بياخد جود انهيلر تكنيك عنده بور ادهرنس ما بيدخنش مظبط الكوموربيديتيز ورغم ده هو وبياخد التريتمنت بتاع الجينا ستاب 4 و5 وريمين ان كنترول رغم كل الماكسيمم اوبشنز اللي عاملها فده بيبقى سيفير ازمه وده مهم جدا لان ممكن كتير جدا لما بنيجي نشخص العين ان هو سيفير ازمه بنلاقيه ان هو ديفيكلت تو تريت او ان كنترول ازمه مش سيفير ازمه فالتصاعد في العلاج بيبقى مش في مصلحه العيان. وات دو يو سجست للنكست ستيب تو ذيس بيشنت هل ان احنا محتاجين تو كونفيرم الدايجنوزز ولا تشيك الانهيلر تكنيك والميديكيشن ادهرنس ولا انفستيجيت فور بريزيستنت انفيرمنتال اكسبوجر وكوموربيديتيز ولا ستيب اب التريتمنت ولا اول اوف ذا اباف يعني هنا هنبقى اول اوف ذا اباف ليه وهو في الالجوريثم ده بتاع الجينا ده ظريف ومش مهم الاوردر فيه هم حتى كاتبين مش مهم الاوردر فيه ان انت بتشوف العيان بياخد البخاخه زي ما احنا قلنا قبل كده وديسكاس الادهرنس والباريانس اللي بياخدهاش ان انت المفروض تكونفيرم الدايجنوز بتاع الازمه وتشوف الانفيرومنتال والريسك فاكتورز والكوموربيديتيز ان انت تاسس ذا تريتمنت ومانجمنت تاني حاجة بقى تخش على كونسيدر الستيب اب تريتمنت مش على طول ان انت العيان جاي زي العيان ده على طول نبتدي على الستيب اب تريتمنت ممكن يبقى فيه انفيرمنتال ريسك فاكتورز او ممكن اصلا الدايجنوز ما يبقاش ازمة اساسا او العيان بياخد البخاخة غلط او العيان ما بياخدش البخاخة اساسا فالحاجات دي كلها مهمة جدا وانتوا اما تيجي تنفستيجيت حالة بتاعت انكونترولد ازمة زي الحالة اللي احنا بنقابلها دي. طيب Uh, what do you suggest pre, uh, as preferred initial treatment to this patient? هل نديله بيدوزنايد اللي هي ال 160 4.5 نديله اثنين شفطه الصبح واثنين بالليل ونديله البيدوزنايد فور مونتلور از نيفر نيدد وشورت كورس اوف اورال كورتيكوسترويدز ولا نديله البيدوزنايد 160 4.5 1 انهيليشن توايس ديلي ونيفر نيدد برضه البخاخه وندي معاه شورت كورس كورتيكوسترويدز ولا ندي فلوتيكازون سالميترول 500 على 50 وان انهيليشن توايس ديلي وصابه او ندي بيدوزينايد فور مترول 160 وان انهيليشن ومعاها لاما ولا ندي فلوتيكازون 250 وان انهيليشن توايس ديلي وصابه از نيدد شورت اورال كورتيكوسترويد يمكن نخلي الاجابه دي بعد ما اقول السلايز اللي جايه احنا بس الستابنج في الجينا يعني نحب نهايلايت اللي هو ان الجينا في الـ في الستاب ال1 ان طبعا كانت الستاب 1 ما كانش فيها كنترول قبل 2019 كان اونلي الصابه كان بتتاخد ونيفر نيدد الميجر تشينجز اللي حصلت حاجتين ان انت البريفيرد كنترول تريتمنت بقى از نيدد اي سي اس وفورمترول از كومباينيشن از بريفيرد كنترول وريليفر ات ذا سيم تايم كان في الفيرذر ستبس قبل كده كانت الصابه اونلي هي التريتمنت بريفيرد فدي النقطه اللي هي اتغيرت في الستاب 2 في حاجتين ان هو البريفيرد ان البريفيرد كنترولر ما فيش في ايكو فوكال افكت ما بين اللو دوز اي سي اس او تدي از نيدد اي سي اس وفورمترول الاثنين ما فيش انفيريوريتي ما بينهم لكن از ريليفر التشويس بيبقى الاي سي اس والفورمترول از تشويس ما بين از تشويس فممكن تكتب كده وممكن تكتب كده في الستيب ثلاثه عنو الثيوفيلين لاول مره رغم اعتراضي عليه احنا بنستخدمه والحقيقه جايب نتائج كويسه وسعره كويس وكاد طبعا مش المين ثيرابي بس كاد اون ثيرابي في مصر اي ثينك ان هو فاليبل وكتير من اساتذتنا يعني بنستعملوه. ستيب اربعه تريتمنت الميديم دوز اي سي اس ولابا خلوها في ستيب اربعه وخلوا الهاي دوز في ستيب خمسه يمكن دي من الحاجات اللي اتغيرت في ستيب خمسه وحطوا بقى اللي هي الانتي الانتي ال 5 وال 4 دولت ما كانوش موجودين يمكن في اللي قبل كده. هنتكلم على التريتمنت بقى كبيوديزينايد والفورمترول في عيان زي ده اللي احنا حاطين الاوبشنز في العلاج بتاعته يعني ندي بيوديزينايد او ندي سالميترول في فلوتيكازون هنختار ايه ف اي ونت تو جايد بسام ستاديز عشان نشوف هل عشان نختار نجاوب الاسئله اللي انا جاوب السؤال اللي انا جاوبته ده ندي له بيوديزينايد فورمترول از كنترول ريفر ولا ندي له سالميترول فلوتيكازون وندي معاه صابه ونيفر نيدد فما نراجع الليترشر هنلاقي فيه سيفرال ستاديز زي الستيم والستاب والستي والسيمبل والكومبلكس والاهاد ستاديز كل دي ستاديز كان بتشوف قصه الاكسسربيشن الريسك اوف سيفير اكسسربيشنز بيقللوها قد ايه فما خد اللي هو البيديزنايد فورمترول از مينتر ريفر اللي هو السمارت ابروتش وقارن في اول سلايد 
وقارن في اول سلايد وقارن في اول سلايد بالبيدوزنايت صابا الون لا في 70% ريدكشن في السيفير اكسسربيشن لما قارنوه بالبيدوزنايت فورميترول قارنوه بالاحمر اللي هو بيدوزنايت صابا ده 39% ريدكشن للاكسسربيشن هنا 53% ريدكشن في الاكسسربيشن هنا 48% لما قارنوه بالبيدوزنايت وهنا 39% ريدكشن في الاكسسربيشن وفي اخر حاجه مع السالميترول وفليكتيكازون وصابا ونيفر نيدد برضو قلل الاكسسربيشن فما نبص مع الكومبارترز كومباينيشن البيدوزنايت فور ميترول از سمارت ابروتش بيعمل ديكريز للسيفير اكسسربيشن عن السلميترول فلوتيكازون وذ صابا او الفيكس دوز من البيدوزنايد فور ميترول او البيدوزنايد مع الصابا وطبعا الكونسبت ان انت بتدي بتاعت اللي هي السمارت ابروتش ان انت بتدي برونكو دايليتر وانتي انفلاماتري ات ذا سيم تايم عكس الكومبكت بتاعت الصابا اوفر يوز ان انت بتدي العين برونكو دايليشن اللي هو سيمتوماتيك تريتمنت وذاوت ريليفنج الانفلاميشن فدي البيهايند ذس ايشو طبعا لما في ستادي اوف 335 بيشنتس ديمونستريتد بيدوزنايت فور ميترول بتريديوس الريسك اوف اكسسربيشن فيرسس سيرميترول فلوتيكازون اما جرنوها باللي هو الدوز 250 50 ومعاهم صابا از نيدد عملت ريدكشن بنسبه 39% البيدوزنايت فور ميترول ريديوس السيفير اكسسربيشن فيرسس الهاي دوز بتاعت السيرميترول فلوتيكازون اللي هي 550 قالت الاكسسربيشن ريدكشن بنسبه 21% لما قارنوها بقى بالسيمتوماتولوجي بالنسبه للناس اللي هم سيفير اكسسربيشن اللي محتاجين ستيرويدز او محتاجين هوسبيتاليزيشن uh, مع الناس اللي هم محتاجين اورال ستيرويد كورسز قللت الاورال ستيرويد كورسز في السيفير اكسسربيشن ب 14% والهوسبيتاليزيشن والاي ار فيسز ب 30% ريدكشن. الكلينيكال دي مجموعه من الكلينيكال ترايلز انكلودينج 778 بيشنتس برضه مقارنه بالبيدوزنايت فور ميترول از ريليفر وكنترولر فيرسس الفلوتيكازون 250 اوفر 50 ده 39 ريدكشن في الفيو في الـ في السيفير اكسسربيشن و39 ريدكشن في الفيور هوسبيتاليزيشن لما كومبيرت بالهاي دوز سالميترول فلوتيكازون 500 اوفر 50 21% فيور اكسسربيشن و31 فيور هوسبيتاليزيشن لما قارنوها بالكلينيشن تشويس اوف يوز اوف فلوتيكازون سالميترول 22 ريدكشن في الاكسسربيشن البيدوزنايد الستاندر اوف كير في السيمتوم كنترول احنا اتكلمنا على الاكسسربيشن وات اباوت السيمتوم كنترول اللي هي النايت سيمتومز اللي بتضايق العيانين او ان هو ما يستخدمش الريليفر عمال على بطال فبيحصل ريدكشن للنايت ويكنج ب 58% اللي هو السمارت ابروتش والريليف الفري دايز ب 61% ريدكشن وطبعا زي ما حضراتكم عارفين ان الفورميترول كمكون بيبقى عنده فاستر برونكو دايليتر افكت مور رابيدلي عن السالميترول وده من ضمن الحاجات اللي ليها بوبيولاريتي في مصر الناس بتحب الفورميترول كومباينيشنز عموما عشان بتحس ان البخاخه اما خدها اديته الافكت في ساعتها فيحس ان تمنها فيها فدي من ضمن الحاجات اللي بتخلي ناس مبسوطه من الفورميترول كومباينيشنز لما بيقارنوا البيدوزنايت فورميترول كريفرنس فاليو مع البيدوزنايت اللي هو البيكلوميسازون دايبروبيرينيت بيشوفوا الايكويفالنت دوزز على اساس ان انت بتستخدم السمارت ابروتش هتستخدم كميه اقل من الانهيلد كورتيكسترويدز عن اما تستخدم اللي هي الفيكسد ستيرويد ولابا كومباينيشن مع صابا ونيفر نيدد فحصل لما خدوا الريفرنس اللي هو البيكلوميسازون دايبروبيرينيت از ريفرنس ستيرويد عمل 25 برودكشن ريدكشن في الانهيلد كورتيكسترويد يوز لما قارنوه بالبيكلوميسازون دايبروبيرينيت كريفرنس فاليو ما بين الفلوتيكازون والبيودوزينايت والبيودوزينايد فور ميترول از ذا اونلي اي سي اس لابا ديمونستريتنج بينيفيت فيرسس هايست دوزز من السالميترول في مالتيبل ستاديز اللي هي الكومباس والاهد والكومباس 3 1 39 ريدكشن في الاكسسربيشن 21 ريدكشن في الاكسسربيشن 22 ريدكشن في الاكسسربيشن يعني في كل الترايلز هو افضل اللي هو السمارت ابروتش الاستراتيجيز اللي مهمه في في التيلرنج تريتمنت في الازمه كنترول uh, عشان تكنترول السيمتومز والاكسسربيشن او الاستراتيجي ان انت بريفيرد ان انت ما تعمل ستيبنج اب التريتمنت ان انت تستخدم الكومباينيشن من اي سي اس للابا تاني حاجه للناس اللي هي جايه لك باكسسربيشن والريسك اوف اكسسربيشن بيبقى ريديوس اكتر لما بتستخدم كومباينيشن من لو دوز اي سي اس فور مترول از بوست مينتننس على ريليفر كومبيرد مع ان انت تستخدم مينتننس كنترولر بلس از نيدد صابه يعني السمارت ابروتش افضل من استخدم اي سي اس 
اي سي اس وازنيد صاب ال خلاص يا باشا كونسيدر ستارتنج ات هاير ستيب في بعض الاحيان انت ممكن تبتدي ات هاير ستيب لو مو لو العين بتاعك عنده موست اوف ذا دي عنده ترابلنج سيمتومز ويكنج اب بالازمه اكتر من وان ويك بتبتدي ودي اللي هي الامريكان ستايل في كتابه البخاخات ان هم بيبتدوا بالدوز الاعلى عشان يحصلوا للليفل اوف كنترول وبعد كده يعملوا لما العين يبقى يتحسن خلال فتره بعد ثلاث اشهر يعملوا الستيبنج داون والانيشال ازما بريزنتيشن لو كان العين سيفيرلي ان كنترولد او عنده اكيوت اكسسربيشن ات از وايز وكلنا بنستخدم القصه دي ان احنا ندي العين شورت كورس اوف اورال كورتيكوسترويدز وندي له الريجولار كنترول زي الميديم دوز اي سي اس ولاب فاحنا لو هنيجي نتكلم على العيان بتاعنا دهوت ايه الحاجات اللي احنا الاستراتيجيز اللي احنا ممكن نستخدمها له ممكن نستخدم له الاستراتيجي بتاعت الكومباينيشن اللو دوز اي سي اس فور مترول از بوس مينتننس وريليفر هتبقى افضل من ان احنا نستخدم له كنترولر اي سي اس مع اي سي اس ولابا واز نيدد صاب تاني حاجه ان العيان بتاعتنا جايين بترابس الازمه سيمتومز وعنده نايت سيمتومز وبيقوم فدي مهم جدا ان انت تستارت بهاير ستاب دوز تاني حاجه ان العيان برضو عنده سيفير ان كنترول سيمتومز فاتوايز ان انت مع الكومباينيشن اللي انت كتبتها ريليفر وكنترولر تدي له اورال كورتيكوسترويدز فعشان كده هنا الاجابه اللي انا شايفها مناسبه للعيان ده ان انت تدي له بيزنايد اللي تدي له الميديم دوز اي سي اس عن طريق ان انت بتدي له 160 بختين كل 12 مع بيزنايد فور مترول ونيفر نيدد اللي هي السمارت ابروتش وتدي له شورت كورتيكوسترويدز اورال اوف اورال كورتيكوسترويدز عن بقيه الاختيارات الثانيه بيزد على الجينا ريكومنديشن والبيشنت طبعا كتب له البرسكرايب بيزنايد فور مترول كانتي انفلاماتري وريفر انهيرر في الريجيمن اللي بعد لمده ثلاث اشهر وبعد كده بيتعمل له ري ايفالويشن التيك هوم مسج ان احنا لغايه دلوقتي من الازمه ستادي حتى اللي هي بتاعت مصر الوحيده اللي اتعملت على الكنترول على ليفل كبير قالت ان الماجورتي احنا عندنا بس 20% هم الكنترول هم اللي كنترولد وعندنا 78% مش كنترولد ان انت ناخد بالنا ان احنا نستخدم الانتي انفلاماتري استراتيجي افتر من اللي هو الكنترولر البرونكو دايليتر استراتيجي الكنترول بيست تريتمنت للمانجمنت الازمه دي مطلوبه في كل الستبس كان الاول مطلوبه من اول ستيب 2 دلوقتي مطلوبه من اول ستيب 1 عشان تو ريسيف سيمتوم دريفن وريجولار دوز اوف كورتيكوسترويد كونتينينج كنترولر لازم في اي ستيب عشان تقدر تعمل تقلل السيمتومز وتعمل كنترول للاكسسربيشنز وتقلل الاكسسربيشنز ان انت يكونك عندك اي سي اس كومباينيشن ومفيش نو لونجر يوز اوف صابا اونلي از تريتمنت في الستيب 1 تريتمنت برضه الحاجات من الاستاديز اللي انا قلتها ان اليوزنج السمارت ابروتش بالبيزنايد فور مترول ككنترول ريليفر بيؤدي للريدكشن في الاكسسربيشن ب 39% وبيعمل كنترول للسيمتومز وبيعمل سيجنيفيكانت ديكريز في في السيفير اكسسربيشن بالاذر كومبارتمنت ثيرابيز اللي احنا قلناها. اند ثانك يو فيري ماتش. ثانك يو سو ماتش بروفيسور اشرف. في اي اسئله؟